Welcome to my thoughts on the 1990s animated X-Men series, Season 3, Episodes 10 and 11, Long Shot and Cold Comfort. Now, before I start, please donate to the SAG after a strike, an extremely important strike. There's a link to do that in the description box, as well as links to videos that explain why this is such an important strike. And... Let's dive into Long Shot. So, yeah, we open on the stereotypical, you know, Jubilee is the stereotypical teenager learning how to drive, and Wolverine is the, the older person who has experience with driving, who is very uncomfortable with how, fad, how fast the teenager is going. And let's see. Yeah, so so long shot pops up and Jubilee trying to impress long shot imitates Storm. <laughs> very, very cute. Just yeah, you know she very clearly has a crush and you know she doesn't have her own thing yet and Storm isn't there to say, Hey, that's my thing, so you know Jubilee was a mistress of pyrokinetics commands you to release that human something like that just yeah and yeah so in this episode some people from the mojo verse go into our world where the you know last time we saw mojo and his people he took people from our world into his dimension so great way to you know it's no wonder they you know we all wanted to see the character again but it would be kind of bland if they just did the same exact thing. Very cool T-1000 wolves. I like how the the language that the, the guys working for Mojo use is all based on, like, television. So instead of, you know, kill them, it's cancel them. Which, you know, really makes me think of, like, retiring, like, in, you know, do androids dream of electric sheep and Blade Runner? And, uh, you know, yeah, when they, when they decide to stop, they say, pull the plug. And <laughs> long broadcast mojo, like, long live. Wow. And, yeah. You know, the, the, um, I didn't catch his name, but like the second in command, you know, says, you know, he, he comes up with a good idea and he like, okay, one, two, three, and Mojo has stolen the idea, taken credit for it. And, let's see, yeah, I, I like that, you know, Jubilee and, and Wolverine you know, return with with Longshot and Xavier's like, who's this guy? And Jubilee is like super defensive, like, he's this guy who needs our help. And Wolverine is like, it's this guy we can't trust. And Xavier, instead of, like, he just he gets to enough fast. He's like, okay. Beast? Because <laughs> Beast is gonna give, you know, he's, Beast is rarely rattled. He gives a very objective account of what's going on and Mojo doesn't think the word earth sounds scary enough so he he feels that you know renaming is you know called for which really tells me he hasn't met, met very many human beings and I like the thing you know okay we're gonna have this this and this but not too much violence, we'll leave that for news and talk shows. Shots fired. But they're like, they're they're not bullets because it's a kid's show, they're like laser blasts and such. So in the in the flashback, one of the like I wait, she yeah, hey, let's see. I guess she's not a rebel, I guess. I guess this this character is working for Mojo, it, you know, it's a it's a character who has fairly feminine traits, but also like a, a beard. I, 
given the time, as much as I'd love to think it's positive representation, I I remember the 90s. I uh, there was not a lot of great representation. I mean, hopefully some some you know trans kids saw it and and felt seen. You know, it's not really like nobody calls nobody says that the character is presenting their gender wrong or something. So let's see. And yeah, we learned Longshot used to be a rebel. Uh, I, f I forget. I mean, actually, uh, I guess I haven't really read any of the, the comics that have Mojo and, and Longshot and such, but I could imagine, and it's, yeah, they did a good job. Like, in the in the first episode, we didn't really feel a need to know exactly what was going on because we understood based on his relationship with Mojo, and we get who Mojo is. But yeah, it's it's very cool that he's secretly, and you know, by the end of the episode, he actually goes back to fight for the rebellion. And I quite like Mojo's introduction to the show, the, the you know, Wolverine, adamantium skeleton, but no protection from a broken heart. Just, yeah. And... I appreciate Mojo saying, you know, the, the, um, I forget her name, so many characters on the show, but the, the, um, the one, the woman with six arms, you know, she's like, really a big purple lizard, and Mojo's like, the kids will love it. I mean, though he looks it, he sure don't act like Barney. And I like, near the end of, of the episode, you know, Mojo's like, chaos, catastrophe, and not a camera in sight. You know, that's the problem, that he can't film it. And he actually imitates Porky Pig, even uses the, the um, I thought, trademarked, you know, that's all folks. So, I don't know, I guess maybe they got permission or something. And that brings us to episode 11, Cold Comfort. So, yeah, very cool to see Iceman and in the the continuity of the show as well. He is one of the original X-Men. And we do see that he helped fight Magneto, but I guess that was before the current team met Magneto. Even though, yeah, it's it's fine. Uh, and he uses the ice slide, which I've always been quite fond of. And in order to get to to get the X Men out of the the facility, Xavier projects these mental images of Kaiju. Very very cool. And they use anti gravity Shi'ar technology to suspend him, which. Seems seems very useful. I wonder if maybe someone could, I don't know, make a hover chair using that exact technology, but then I guess that would require for the hover chair only to be constructed after Xavier already met the Shi'ar, so I guess that's not happening on this show. I'm kidding, I'm not actually sore about that. I just think it's kind of funny that they, you know, he has the hover chair from day one, and now they're talking, oh yeah, anti-grav Shi'ar technology. And, yeah, there's some there's some video, Jubilee can, sits and watches video of Iceman, and they're in the 60s suits. Very cool. I, I'm glad that they're, that that's there as, like, Easter egg. I'm glad that those are not the suits they're wearing in the regular show. I, I get that for 60s standards, they were considered really cool to teenagers. By 90s standards, they seemed really corny. Even if you only started reading comics in the 90s. And I was wondering if they were going to do, because one of the things I do remember from the very, very first X-Men comic is that Bobby, you know, in addition to being this, like, fairly immature character, he actually turns himself into a snowman fairly early on to, to like, say, you know, oh, if they're going to treat me like a child, I'm going to act like a child. And 
yeah, in in the footage that Jubilee watches, he actually he like makes snowballs and juggles with them, which yeah, that's uh that's the kind of thing he would do in the original comics. And yeah, so we get the backstory and yeah, so so Lorna became you know, once once the conflict between mutants and humans started, the mutant problem, to quote Bobby Drake's mother in X2, you know, yeah, Lorna became more and more like Xavier, insisting that they have a responsibility to use the mutant powers to fight, and ends up leaving and faking her disappearance, but leaving the note to lead him there. And yeah, great fight between X-Men and X-Force. I was, uh, X-Factor, I was hoping we'd get one of the other teams, one of the, yeah, one of the other X-Teams. You know, X-Factor, X-Force, one of those. And yeah, we, we did indeed get Quicksilver and you know, the point is made that, you know, if they change adversaries, because several of them clearly know the limits of the other's powers and such. And, yeah, um, you know, the team features Havoc, Forge, Wolf's Bane, so, you know, yeah, several that we already also, yeah, that, that you may already be familiar with if you've watched the live-action movies. And, yeah, I... I completely forgot the the. Um, I prefer this version of Wolf Spain's look to what they inflicted upon us in New Mutants, the the live action movie. Um, let's see, but yeah, and and here they don't point out that Havoc is the brother of Cyclops, which I guess him being adopted, he wouldn't know. Yeah, it's possible neither that that Havoc doesn't know either, and you know they could bring the character back and make a thing out of them being brothers. And this is the first time we see Forge in the present day. We've only seen the older version in the you know future timeline with Cable. And yeah, they. <laughs> They were they weren't trying to kill the X Men. They were it was just training, and Forge says, "I grant you, we didn't really give you any warning." And he does point out, "You did break into our facility. You know, we're we're just protecting the just, uh, yeah." And uh, you know, another yet another broken heart. Uh, you know, there are a number of those on the show. Uh, you know, Bobby was hoping that. Lorna would be happy to see him, and, you know, she fell in love with, with Havoc. And it is, you know, it is really a really good point, this thing of, you know, she, the thing she was in love with with Bobby was the, the you know, yeah, once, once he, you know, they basically, they grew apart is what happened. You know, she wanted someone who would fight for the the for for mutant rights you know and it's that thing of something that you see a number of misogynists claim is not the case but she actually you know she verbally expressed what she wanted from him she said we have to do this you know this is and over time because they didn't come to an agreement on that. They they grew apart. You know, it wasn't like just one day out of the blue she stopped loving him or something. She, you know, she knew what she wanted. She verbally expressed it to him. He didn't go in that direction. He didn't meet her in the middle. And because of that, eventually, the, yeah, the relationship just didn't, make that much sense to her anymore and you know obviously she shouldn't have made it look like the, the like it was a, a disappearance she, you know because like he thought and we thought that she had been like kidnapped you know so obviously that's you know but it's an action show and every, you know it's a it's a comic book trope that when you know good guys meet other good guys for the first time they gotta fight 
so that we can see how you know how their powers like you know is this person really good against this other person you know kind of thing but I think that might be about what I had yeah I, I like the idea of like an actual government sanctioned team and I think that might be what X-Factor are it's been a long time since I read X-Factor about X-Factor in the comics but I feel like that was what they they were there as well where X-Men at least started out I forget if maybe like I, I have I definitely haven't read all of X-Men but they started out as a private enterprise you know they they try to help out civilians but they're not government sanctioned and that is one thing that has led to some issues over the years and and it's maybe also one of those things where like you know it's from like it started in the 60s not every teenager was crazy about the government in the 60s you may have heard about the the there was a bit of a you know a lot of young people were moving away from the the status quo so it made sense you know there's a lot of a lot of the heroes that were introduced in comic books in the 60s were not directly affiliated you know comparatively like if you look at really early batman stories like batman works with the cops you know he's he's yeah so there's a there's a significant difference there and superman a lot of his early stories you know he's also like helping the government fa fairly directly there's a level of trust there you know because when they were created which i want to say was like late 20s or sometimes in the th sometime in the 30s 40s so i hold on batman So the the very first Batman was 39 and Superman was in 38 yeah and and yeah you know not not in every single early story and I'm not sure it was 100% from the very start but there was a yeah you know the the yeah the the the, the a lot of the American population really trusted the government to do the right thing in in those days, and you know later they learned to that that was wrong. But I think that might more or less cover what I have to say. I'd like to see more of the X Factor. I forget if they do return later in this show, but this does make for a good. You know, you could see how. Like, I mean, it was very early days of internet, but there was probably a way, maybe maybe letters to the, the studio or something, you know, kids could express which characters they wanted to see more of, you know, they make sure to point out who everyone, you know, Forge introduces every, every single X Factor member and near the end of the episode. So, yeah, it, it's you would know who to to you know write that you wanted to see more of and yeah so i uh, let's see i'm glad they did manage to fit in uh, bobby drake i like the character in the comics and live action movies I'm not super unhappy that he's not like a main team member. I, you know, I don't think that's quite necessary. I appreciate that they let him be both badass and goofy in this. Like, pretty badass at the start where, you know, at the first we don't even, we don't even get a clear look at him at, at first. And he's like freezing, like these guards, you know, just... Yeah, pretty intense stuff for, for a kid's show. And I suppose that might be everything 
that I have to say. Right, and yeah, and, and this also doesn't point out that, you know, in in the comics, the, um, ah, I know, let's book my tongue. Quicksilver is the son of Magneto. You know, and they have some great stories that use the fact that they're related. You know, not really in the live action movies, but in the comics. And that, you know, yeah, this this leaves the door open for that. It's not like the character disappears at the end of the episode or anything. And there's a, a pretty cool setup there with Magneto fighting against you know, like he probably would not fight alongside the government and here his son is. There's a there's an interesting conflict there which I am not 100% certain they end up doing, doing anything with on this show. But that's, you know, like there's so many decades of comic. Like when this show started there was about three decades of X-Men stories. The show would basically have to run like I mean, I don't know if it would ever be able to completely catch up as long as there's still X-Men books being put out, but it would definitely take them an extremely long time to completely catch up. And I think they do a good job of, like, hinting at stories that, like, might come to fruition if the audience is excited enough about. I think that pretty well covers it. The, these are two episodes where like Jubilee is very open towards the the young man that you know she doesn't know but clearly has a past. Wolverine really doesn't trust him you know even though he doesn't necessarily know everything about him and you know ultimately like, she's a little too eager to, to trust, he's a little too reluctant to trust, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle, that is a good message for the show to be conveying, and yeah, that's it for these two episodes, so, catch you tomorrow, make mine marvel.